declaring the end from the beginning. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living being. May the God of peace himself sanctify you completely and your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. A threefold cord is not quickly broken. Bear fruit to God that your fruit should remain. A heartful shalom called out sons and daughters of the Most High God, Yahuwah, sanctified and preserved in Yahushua HaMashiach. Thanks for tuning in again, and may mercy, peace, love be multiplied unto you. Now, as bride of Mashiach, we are to keep watch with our eyes and skin open. I say this statement to help paint a picture of how our eyes, the eyes of our entire being, spirit, soul, and body, to be set upon Yahushua, our Messiah. Since we learned in the previous presentation that even our skin have eyes or photoreceptors that kind of act like cell towers, if you think about it, and our eyes act like the main satellite, from an infrastructure perspective when it comes to communication, it then becomes pretty important that we keep both lines of communication open and working. We also talked about the protective significance of having our eyes and our skin exposed to the sun in the physical sense, but in a spiritual sense, we are also to expose our eyes and our skin, our entire being, to the sun of the Most High, Yahuwah. So if you combine both concepts, it just makes sense that Malachi says that there is healing in the wings of the sun of righteousness. And modern science would agree that by simply setting our eyes to the rising and the setting of the sun helps reset and regulate our body's internal biological clock, and this is known as circadian rhythm. You see, in our fallen state, we are in constant need of healing. And one of the most high's attributes is that he is Yahuwah Rapha. Rapha in Hebrew means healer. And so learning and knowing the word of Yahuwah heals, restores, and preserves us in the totality of our being. Sometimes we forget how powerful words are. Language is the foundation of learning and receiving the law or the loving instructions of the Father is what we need for our souls to be converted according to his good, acceptable, and perfect will. Now, language is really expressed in frequencies combined into words that are made up of letters. And there are 22 Hebrew letters. The attributes and the Torah of our Abba Yah is hidden in plain sight in these Hebrew letters, making up the foundation of Yahuwah's word in communicating who he is to us and in us. And since the heavens declare the glory of Yahuwah, we see this illustrated for us in communication between the light frequencies of the sun as well as our electromagnetic frequencies that we both receive and emit within our bodies. Now, to receive the healing frequencies of the sun, our maker has equipped the skin of our cells or the covering of our cells with this polyunsaturated fat known as omega-6 or DHA. Now this type of fatty acid is found mostly in the cell membranes that make up the cells of our eyes, skin, gut, and our brain. Now the molecular structure of this fatty acid contains 22 carbon atoms. Let me emphasize the number 22. That is the same number of Hebrew letters. Now these 22 carbon atoms also have six double bonds, 
which act like copper wires and by design making communication possible between the sun and the cell membranes of our cells. Have you thought about why your mobile communication device is called cell phone? Do you think that what we call technology today is simply a mimicry of the beautiful biological system that the creator has designed in all of us? Communication that takes place inside our bodies between the different cellular localities and organ cities can be thought of as how urbanized cities function in today's world, how completely dependent the world's communication is on power and energy. Didn't Matthew 6, 22 and Luke eleven thirty six say the same thing? That when the body is full of light, the body is healthy. Now, what happens when the power goes off in a city and communication is unavailable? Chaos. Chaos in the body is called inflammation. Inflammation is the leading cause of a lot of today's disease. And didn't Paul tell us in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 from verse 12 to 25 that the human body has many parts and that the many parts of the body make up one whole body? So it is with the body of Christ. So what Paul tells us about how each and every members of our body matters and the need for harmony is what science has come to discover. No matter how seemingly insignificant a particular member of the body is, all members are equally important as the rest. So each member not only has a purpose, but is also interconnected to the entire system. In the midst of the Garden of Eden, the Tree of Life represents Mashiach, who is the light of life. And that light is in us and the light of the world. And we are called to be the light of the world. And so when we walk in this light and speak Mashiach, we manifest heaven on earth. When we have the mind of Mashiach, we are in Echad or one with the Father because we are not double-minded. We are steadfast and manifest who we are in Messiah. And that is love. We are the individual expression of Yahuwah's love here on earth. And so this sanctification, our life's journey is to get past the tree of knowledge of good and evil and partake from the tree of life. Unlike the woman in the garden, when she prematurely took from that tree is the reason why there is duality in this fallen world. Our eyes remain veiled and therefore we are unable to see. In a sense, the light of life in us is bent and therefore we have blind spots. And Paul in Luke eleven thirty six alludes to part darkness or dark corners. Paul says, if then your whole body is full of light, having no part dark, then the whole body will be full of light, as when the bright shining of a lamp gives you light. To me, this is very clear. When the whole body is full of light, then there's no part darkness or blindness. Because what the bending or the manipulation of light creates is an invisibility cloak technology that has been developed to make objects disappear. So this invisibility cloak stealth material can hide objects by bending light. So when there is part dark in us or when there is a bending of light inside us, then we end up with blind spots. There are really two states of vision, having eyes that cannot see or dumb down light or bent light. And the other is having eyes that can see, resulting in an enlightened state of consciousness, affecting the whole body, literally the light of Mashiach in us shining. Now the question is, which state of vision do you have or do you desire to have? If you delight in the law of Yahuwah, he will grant you the desires of your heart. We see this journey towards enlightenment 
in Luke chapter 24, where we find two travelers on the road to Emmaus. Interestingly, the word Emmaus, in its root etymology, yem, and its meaning is uncertain. How appropriate that is in the description of the two travelers who seem to be uncertain by the recent events that's taken place in the death and the resurrection of the Messiah. Both seem to have had eyes that were restrained. The word restraint in Greek is krateo, which means to get possession of, with a root word kratos, meaning force or power. It's like their eyes were possessed by force. They had eyes powered shut, like we talked about in the previous video, that they did not recognize it was Yahushua that was conversing with them. They didn't quite see the full picture as of yet. Not until they were fully bathed or immersed in the word of Yahuwah. And how were they immersed in the word of Yahuwah? Remember in the beginning was the word or sound and the word became flesh. Or in other words, the sound frequency materialized. Sound turned into something that we can see. Let's understand first how the two travelers could have processed the word being spoken over them by our Messiah. So when they were hearing Yahushua speaking over them in their finite state, they could only process so much. You see, in our finite and fallen state, we have limitations. And so hearing words are not always sufficient. Although faith starts by hearing, it is just the beginning. Now I can describe a series of events to you, but as a listener, you are required to hold in your working memory the concepts of what I'm trying to describe. But because our working memory doesn't have infinite capacity, we can only take in so much through listening. Same is true for reading. Only until Mashiach Yahushua sat at the table and illustrated who he is to them by his actions, by taking the bread, blessing and breaking it and giving it to them, was when their eyes were opened and they knew him. What happened? The word or the sound of Yahuwah, Yahushua himself, materialized before them. So they were now able to visualize what Yahushua was teaching them. And so the word was set in motion picture. And they were able to ascend to a higher level of understanding. It's like the veil was lifted off their eyes. And until Mashiach illustrated the taking of the bread, representing himself as the bread of life, blessing the bread. In Hebrew, the word blessed is barak, which means to kneel down. So I see this as the bread from above, lowering himself, descending so he can be broken or taste death for us on our behalf. It is in the shedding of blood of Mashiach that caused their eyes to open. And now they're able to see and know who he is, who they were talking to. Now, going back to the text in Luke 24, verse 32, we see the culmination of their experience of their time with the Messiah, having his words pour over them from the road to Emmaus, all the way to the table of his presence. Verse 32 describes that it was like their hearts burned within them. How appropriate given that the word Emmaus also means warm baths. And so the teachings of Messiah poured over them like warm water and the words of the resurrected Savior married into their hearts with the visual illustration conceptualized in their souls, giving birth to understanding. This is what Yahuwah, our Father, delights in doing. He is seeking to unveil our eyes and to reveal His Son, Yahushua, in us. 
so that the eyes of our understanding be enlightened, illuminating the hidden in the simplicity of his word. His word is love in us. He sent his son who is love in us and among us so we can behold him. According to a professor of neuroscience, Steve Yantis, what vision buys over language is the ability to see relationships all at once rather than unfolding over time. What a profound statement. And this is why in the beginning was the word and the word was with Yah and the word was Yahuwah and that he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Ruach or the breath or the word of Yahuwah is saying. Because once you can hear, once you hear and respond, Yahuwah then gives your eyes light to see further, to unbend within you that's causing part darkness. And so that the word becomes flesh the word will now materialize before your eyes and you will literally have the richness of our Messiah dwelling in your heart. And so now you're able to behold and express the image of the Father in what you say, what you do, and who you are. Yahusha moves us from understanding to a state of overstanding. With this fresh in our minds, we need to understand that it is built in within us to have the ability to activate the shine that is in us. We do this by responding to the call of Yahuwah. We hear and then we learn. Then we obey. And the more we learn, the more we see. The more we see, the more we understand the loving instructions or the law of Abaya, word became flesh. What is the ultimate purpose of learning and manifesting the word in us? Well, the scripture says Yahuwah is love. If we are children of love, then that makes us individual expression of who Yahuwah is, and he is love. So we learn the law or the instructions of Yahuwah so we can love in this dimension. Galatians 5.14 says, For all the law is fulfilled in one word. Even in this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. So let's go back to the garden story and let's take another crack at understanding why Paul makes a reference of Adam being a type of Messiah. But this time, as offsprings of love, how do we become love on earth? How do we become extensions of the Father's hands and feet here on earth? In the Genesis chapter 2 creation story, the first man received the neshama or the breath of the Father. So if the Father is love, then his spirit is love and is put inside the first man, Adam. Genesis 2, 15. Then Yahuwah Elohim took the man and put him in the garden. Now the Hebrew word for put is to rest, to set down, to make quiet. I want you to imagine Adam as the seed that's planted in the garden. And remember, the seed represents the spirit or the neshama of love. Botanically speaking, from a seed germination perspective, we know that a seed consists of a protective coating, some kind of storage tissue with nutrient reserves, as well as a dormant plant embryo. Think of Yahuwah's neshama put in Adam a seed. And since Yahuwah is love, this is the seed of love. A dormant plant embryo carrying the seed of Yahuwah's neshama, the seed of love. Now think of all the goodness and amazing reserves this seed comes with and the spiritual potentiality to manifest in the earth realm. But first, lying dormant within the seed. We further know that under the correct conditions, this dormant embryo can be awakened to germinate 
and grow into a mature plant. Adam was infused by the Nashama, or love of Yahuwah. Yahuwah is spirit, and so how can spirit express itself in the earth realm? How can the seed that carries eternity manifest itself in the realm in which it was planted? For seed to germinate, for the spirit to express its giftings, it must first die as we understand death. But botanically speaking, the seed actually is not dead. It merely needs to break open. So death from our perspective is simply an illusion. Going back to the creation narrative, Adam is referred to as man from Genesis chapter 2, verse 7 to 18. Verse 18 says, Yahuwah Elohim makes this statement. He says, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. But after verse 18, verse 19, you notice the first mention of the word Adam. Remember, Dom in Hebrew means blood, implying death. So from verse 19 and 20, you see the first mention of Adam. And I see this as his first manifestation of expressing his Neshama gift of creativity and name-giving ability. Remember, he's being entrusted in naming the birds of the air and the beast of the field. Now, naming living creatures is no small job. Name brings with it the character and uniqueness of each of the creatures. Adam would have had to study each of these creatures and appropriate its purposes and function within the name he chooses to give. But Yahuwah continues to note for Adam that there was not found a helper comparable to him. So there is yet something more profound that the Creator has in reserve for Adam that will be a fit extension for him as a means of expressing the Neshama further placed into him. So the Neshama of Yahuwah is like the covering or the glory of Adam. And Adam's wife is the glory of the husband. This gives us further insight as to what Paul is referring to in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 7. For a man indeed ought not to cover his head, since he is the image and glory of the Creator. So in a sense, man or Adam's head is covered by the Neshama of Yahuwah, the Neshama or the Spirit of Yahuwah is the word of Yahuwah, Yahushua, the expressed image and the glory of the Creator. And then Paul goes on by saying, the woman is the glory of man. So Adam's wife, the woman, is the glory of the husband or Adam. And we've mentioned several times in previous videos that Eve is a type of our soul. Our soul is the glory of our spirit man. The woman is the glory of man. The wife is the glory of the husband. And so what I'm trying to express here is that the spirit cannot manifest itself in and of itself in the earth realm. That is why the spirit needs to take possession of a soul because through the soul, through the living being that animates this earthen vessel is how the soul expresses itself in this earth realm. So the spirit expresses itself through the soul and the soul expresses itself or manifests its capabilities through the body. Now there is also a prophetic significance that we need to catch here. Before the revealing of the forming of the woman, Notice that Yahuwah Elohim caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam. The Hebrew word behind caused, it is nafal, which means to fall a violent death, to lie, be cast down, fail or prostrate oneself before. Adam did not just fall asleep here. 
I hope you see that. Deep sleep is tardama in Hebrew, which means to be in a trance. From the root word radam, which means be unconscious. So a part of Adam's triune nature experienced death here. And what is about to be revealed is both the glorification and the prophetic word of Yahuwah, which gives us further understanding as to why Paul would refer to Adam as a type of Messiah who was to come. You see, Eve's disobedience did not catch Yahuwah by surprise. He was making a provision for her redemption even before she was formed out of Adam. Think about this. The scripture says, walk in the spirit and you will not, you cannot fulfill the lust of the flesh. Adam had the neshama breathed into him. He walked in spirit with Yahuwah fully in him. So Adam cannot fulfill the lust of the flesh. So for Adam to be able to partake of the same fruit that the woman ate from, he had to have descended from consciousness, lowering himself so he can give himself for his bride. He loved the woman or Eve so much that he joined her in her predicament. Adam was not deceived. Eve was. So we see that Yahuwah caused a part of Adam to fall prostrate, to be cast down. And the part that was cast down, I believe, is the Nashama of Adam. It is interesting to note that you don't see anywhere in the text that Adam was awakened out of this deep trance. So in other words, his Nashama remained cast down. And this is where the distinction lies between the first Adam and the last Adam. The first Adam did not wake up out of his deep sleep because Yahuwah cannot contradict his word. His word says in Psalm 49, 7, Truly no man can ransom or redeem another or give to Elohim the price of his life. There is only one who is worthy, the lamb slain from the foundation of the world who was dead but is now alive, who awoken or rose from the dead. You see, unlike the first Adam who we know the scripture has recorded his time of death at 930 years of age. But the last Adam became a life quickening or a life giving spirit. Adam, a type of our spirit, is a type of the covering or atonement needed by Eve, a type of our soul. So just like how the creator gave to Adam directly his commandment, and not to Eve. Our spirit is a conduit of the commandments or the loving instructions of Abba Yah for our souls. And the word that's coming from the spirit of Yahuwah to teach our soul the truth of his word. The law of Yahuwah is what converts our souls. Yahuwah who is spirit, he seeks those who will worship him in spirit and truth. It didn't say soul and truth. Our spirit man delights in the law of Yahuwah. And since our soul is the weaker vessel, 1 Timothy chapter 2 verse 15 says something pretty important for us to pay attention to. Nevertheless, she, Timothy, is referring to Eve in this text. A type of our soul will be saved or will experience sanctification in childbearing if they continue in faith love holiness with self-control what is timothy trying to get us to understand this is a call to bear the fruit of the spirit which we know ultimately is sourced in love by love for love and how this is done is by the intimacy of knowing yahuwah through his Messiah. To be one with him is to walk in the spirit by the strength of Mashiach. When you realize this or when your real eyes see this, you will know 
without a shadow of doubt that we have been equipped. We have been given everything that we ever need for life and godliness to journey back to the garden of the light, the garden of Eden, kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. This is the grace of our salvation. This is the reward of choosing to walk in obedience in the spirit. The first man, Adam, represents our spirit man who became a living being or soul in order to express the image of the Most High here on the earth realm. But the last Adam, who became a life-quickening or life-giving spirit, representing the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, the only one worthy and prevailed to open the scroll and open its seals, the Lamb of Yahuwah slain from the foundation of the world and by His blood able to redeem every tribe and tongue and people and nation and to lead them to truth and everlasting life. Yahusha is the only one worthy to redeem man and restore back the neshama that Yahuwah Elohim breathed into Adam's nostrils from the beginning. Yahusha, who is the word of Yahuwah, the life-giving spirit, is the only covering that our spirit man needs in order to connect with the life-giving spirit of our Messiah. In the next presentation, we will shift our focus back to Eve and remind ourselves of this methodology Isaiah 46.10 has established in understanding the trajectory we find ourselves in in these last days. And how do we do that? By studying and going back to the beginning declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times the things that are not yet done. We do this because we know that Yahuwah's counsel shall stand and he does all according to his good pleasure. Be still and know. The things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do and the God of peace will be with you.